Hi, and welcome to Global Governance Futures, based out of the Global Governance Institute at University College London. This is a podcast about the challenges facing humanity and possible global responses. If you're new to the show and you want to get a list of our favourite books, other resources, listen to past shows and to join our community, go to ucl.ac.uk forward slash global dash governance. We're really delighted to have Sophie Harmon on the podcast today. Sophie is Professor of International Politics at Queen Mary University of London and a world-leading authority on the politics of global health governance with wide-ranging expertise on women, gender, post-colonialism, the politics of securitization, to name just a few. Um, Her research draws on a deep world of fieldwork experience, both within the corridors of power in Geneva, DC, New York, but also extensive field work across Africa, most recently, I think, in Sierra Leone, just prior to COVID-19 being declared an international public health emergency by the WHO in February 2020. So it's uh, it's great Sophie was able to get that field work in before everything got shut down. Um, Sophie's doing some of the most really penetrating research on global health in the IR space, and is also a real inspiration for scholars keen to draw on insights from across disciplines, as well as mix it up when it comes to how we actually do research. Alongside academic accolades, including being awarded the Joni Lovandusky Prize by the Political Science Association in 2018, Sophie is also one of my more uh, star-studied colleagues, having been nominated for the BAFTA for outstanding debut by a British writer, director or producer in 2019 for her feature film, Peely, a powerful examination of the lived experience of those living with HIV AIDS in Tanzania. This no doubt formidable undertaking informs her recent book, Seeing Politics, Film, Visual Method and International Relations, which explores the frontier of how storytelling through the medium of film can open up new vistas for IR scholarship, which often does remain quite methodologically conservative. So we're really excited to have a chance to chat with you, Sophie. Thanks so much for joining us today. Thanks, um, before, <laughs> before we get into it, I'll just invite the pod crew to introduce themselves. Hi, I'm Jessica. I am a co-founder of the podcast and I help with research and logistics. And I am super excited to speak with Sophie today. Hi, I'm Zoe. I'm also a co-founder of the podcast and I help with the research and some of the social media aspects of things. And again, I'm like Jess, I'm super excited to speak with Sophie today. All right, great. So where to begin? A lot to talk about. Um, Perhaps we'll begin with a big picture question, both sort of within IR, but also looking out into the world. So I don't know whether you agree, but there often feels like there's a bit of a lag between changes out there in the real world and then the ability of our discipline to keep up with those changes. And I'm wondering from your vantage point, um, where do you see the most exciting work happening in IR at the moment? And do you think the whole COVID-19 pandemic will change the discipline in any way? Perhaps, for example, breaking down the traditional separation of domains like security, international political economy, issue specific areas like health or climate, and also disciplinary silos and and those sorts of perhaps arbitrary uh, distinctions that we often see out there. I love it. Start with the big question. Um, Well, obviously, in the past, I would have said all the interesting research is happening in global health. But now I am so bored of global health because (laughs) we're all so bored of global health. Um, And for years, lots of people were saying global health politics matters. We need to take this seriously in international relations. And everyone sort of said, oh, yeah, yeah, you can have your section at ISA, the International Studies Association. You can do your fringe stuff. But really, you know, what's this got to do with international relations and international politics? And so this is the worst time to be right about things. I think lots of people in global health were thinking, oh, my gosh, you know, we've been talking about this for ages. 
IR has now discovered global health. We've been pointing that out. No one wants to be right about this stuff at the moment. So yeah, in the past, I would have said global health, but now I'm super bored of global health. Um, and I think what's more interesting for me is actually in visual politics. So people who work in visual politics and also emotions and international relations as well. I think that's really, the, you know, the stuff that is the stuff that I kind of like to read. So when you're sort of, you know, you think it's a pet project or something you're not actually doing research on. Um, I really enjoy reading kind of work around that. I always enjoy reading new feminist research as well. Um, but is it going to break down these kind of silos in IR? I mean, I think these are conversations we've been having for a really long time. And I'm not sure if we just make these silos up sometimes to create panels or put order on workshops. I think people are more open to learn a bit more from other people. I think you're always going to have some people always just stuck in their kind of this is what I do I'm a neo-realist I just talk to the neo-realists and I'm going to stick like this until I get tenure and then I'm going to ignore everyone else until you know I find it relevant but actually I think you're seeing more people getting interested in wider questions of method and areas of research we haven't thought about before so the politics of science and scientists whether that's in climate change environmental research or indeed in global health so I think we have to break down those silos um, and I think international relations has been a bit slow on that particularly with the methods part as well which perhaps we can get into in a bit um, but yeah so where's the exciting research yeah anywhere but global health but those who listen to the podcast and don't know anything about global health politics you know go to the BISA go to the ISA working groups find your global health politics friends go and read all about it because everything that's happened with COVID-19 you could see from past pandemics as well and we've got a rich body of research that we can draw on. Yeah I mean I think we are going to get a bit into global health today <laughs> given we've got <laughs> one of the world leading authorities on it with us um, but I yeah I totally I totally take what you're saying and it's it is a it is an extra, extraordinary moment really I think there's the or there's sort of there's a lot of activity that's been on the periphery perhaps of the discipline which is now sort of making itself heard more i think methodologically it's really interesting to explore the the potential value of of say visual arts um different mediums for telling stories i mean perhaps it would be great just to hear from you i mean in, in sort of pursuing that sort of methodological approach after having you know gone through the tenure track process and having had to sort of pay homage to the perhaps the, the 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 gatekeeping sort of context that we sometimes have to navigate in the discipline, what what was it that was most uh, empowering about that new direction? And perhaps also, what was the biggest surprise for you Ooh, in bringing oh, that love... into into your okay. research? Oh, that's a great question. I think. Um... Well, I think the first thing is the gatekeeping question is really important because I'm asked this quite a lot. And I think I was able to make a film because I had a hugely supportive academic department. So the School of Politics and International Relations at Queen Mary, you know, they didn't think I was bonkers. They just said, oh, actually, I think you can pull this off. Whereas I think a lot of other places would have been like, hmm, is it not better that you just get another university press book? You know, the ref is around the corner. So having backing like that, I think is important. But also I was at a stage of my career where I could take the risk. So if it all fell flat, if it didn't work, if I said, look, I'm going to do this film, I'm going to think about it methodologically. And it just was, you know, a bad film or the film, I just didn't make a film. It would, you know, I'd have to be accountable to my funder, but I'd already got an established career so I could take that risk. And I think that's a real issue when we're trying to advance different methods and innovations is who can be innovative in international relations. You can really only do it when you've got a permanent job, when you have research funding and you have the support of people saying, OK, we're going to let you do this and take a risk. Um, surprising aspect of that, I think, is doing the research, you know. In your head, everyone said, oh, doing a film is cool and it's fun. And it is neither of those things. Like, you know, it's such a pain. I mean, the fun bit is definitely the BAFTAs, red carpet, all that stuff. I mean, like, I'm not even going to lie. That was amazing. But that's just like a tiny snippet. All the stuff that comes before is just a real, it's not fun and it's not cool. But 
it's really interesting about navigating some of those relationships, both with the filmmakers and how they see the story and the research process, and also the women I made the film with. So the film is made with women um, living with HIV in rural Tanzania, and the kind of relationship I had to them as well, and how that changed and their agency that they had and exhibited during the film. So I think when you go and work with these communities, you're always very conscious of how you might be positioning yourself or how you might abuse your privilege or you know, act in an unethical way. And you don't actually think about how they might do that or how they might use these kind of power relations to their own advantage. And that was just really fascinating for me. And especially, it just kind of confronts a little bit of your academic arrogance. You know, you study these power relations, you study patronage, you study all this kind of colonial legacies. And then when you're actually immersed in it, how do you act in a way that isn't a colonial oppressor? How do you stop having that kind of white woman guilt around that? I think was a really interesting thing for me not in a kind of self-help kind of like oh you know poor me the white woman going into you know these communities and they don't love me as a savior not like that but just actually understanding the agency of the people that you're working with I think was really revealing and then on the other side for the kind of like the discipline side how many people are really keen to embrace the film when it was a success and then those who were kind of interested in it but were not really sure if it was academic And, you know, what is an academic output? Why is it not a documentary? But, you know, I'm big enough to handle that. That's fine. That was just more funny. You know, it never came from people who'd seen the film. People who'd seen the film get the film. People who haven't seen the film, they'd be like, what is this documentary you've made? It's, you know, anyone can do this. And I just thought, well, we'll see. That sounds like a, a good sort of zen attitude to take, really. Just yeah, don't get in broad. In <laughs> it wasn't always like that. I should add. I mean, this is years on. I am now like, ha ha. But no, at the time it was just like, oh, I'm having this argument again. Great. I mean, let's get into that a little bit more. I mean, you know, I, I'm the I'm I work in global governance. I mean, what, what is global governance? You know, uh, and often it can seem like a very elitist endeavor. And you, when you look at, say, qualitative research in that field, it's often at that level. It's often there's a lot of very elite level interview data and um, the focus is predominantly on kind of the big organizations in that space, the World Health Organization or the WTO or whatever it may be. There has been a push by certain scholars, um, people like Jason Seabrook, Rawdon Wilkinson and others to bring in sort of a more everyday global governance. How is global governance received by those who are often at the sharp end of, say, big austerity restructure programs or whatever it may be? But that remains somewhat peripheral in the mainstream conversation, although I think it's beginning to make inroads. And I was just wondering whether you'd have any reflections on that, um, you know, why is it so important to take Mm. seriously the everyday global governance experience of people such as women in Tanzania, who I assume also are recipients of global aid programs and, and, and those sorts of global governance initiatives? Yeah, I think ever since I did my PhD on the World Bank and AIDS, I was interested in those kind of, you know, the Geneva DC institutions and what they say and what they do. But if you don't see what that's actually happening on the ground, then what's the point of looking at it? So it's, you can see that as the everyday, you can label it as the local, you can say it's community engagement, however you want or bottom up global governance. I think this has been around in global governance for a while, but people kind of label it differently. Um, But yeah, I think you can come up with all the policies, norms, recommendations, And then for years, everyone says, well, why is it not working? You're like, well, have you ever gone and asked the people it's meant to affect why it's not working or trace the money down or trace the policy down from, you know, the bank. So the World Bank, sorry, or the WHO to what happens in countries, then what happens in the district. And I've always thought that you have to do it in that kind of multi-level, multi-sectoral governance analysis. Otherwise, it's never going to make sense in the same way the bank or the WHO doesn't just come up with these ideas. They're meant to come from countries or they're, you know, the people who work in these institutions normally come from these countries as well. So it's looking at all those different factors. And I think if you're just going to 
analyze the policies of these organizations, you're going to get some insight, but it's not really going to tell you much. And it's not going to tell you much about why things do or don't change. Um, and I think like many people working in international relations, you know, James C. Scott's Weapons of the Week, I'm always fascinated by how people at the kind of receiving end or the end point subvert in very small ways these processes because you know that they know that they're not around forever. They know that they're going to leave or they're not going to make sense and how these kind of norms don't really work within their communities as well. So, yeah, I've been interested in that for a while. And it's interesting you mentioned Rawdon because Rawdon Wilkinson was my PhD supervisor. So he's totally stolen my ideas. I can tell, say that now. He wasn't looking at this before. I'm only joking, he was. That's great. Okay, thanks, Sophie. <laughs> um, so I, I think Jess wants to come in. Uh, yes, I just, I'd like to talk a little bit more about the film. Um, we found that a really powerful watch, and personally, I was on the edge of my seat the entire time I was watching it. Um, but I know you've touched on this a little bit, but um, why do you believe this story needed to be told, and why present your research through this medium specifically? Thanks so much. That's really lovely that you've watched it and you have such positive feedback. Um, yeah, so I've been working on the politics and the governance of HIV and AIDS for a really long time. And actually, this relates to Tom's question of then you go to these kind of high level meetings in these institutions or you go to another IR conference and everyone's talking about what should happen with AIDS or, you know, what should happen in Africa. And nobody is going and engaging with these stories or what's happening at the other, you know, at the end point effectively. And then I combine that with a kind of feminist sensibility around women during pandemics and women during big global health initiatives. So for years, we've known that women actors, the carers, the volunteers, the people who are the majority of people living with HIV, and yet their kind of everyday stories aren't told or how they make sense of the politics of this isn't told. So I really wanted to have a way of showcasing those stories and engaging with kind of affects of audiences as well. So that's kind of like why the film medium came up of how to connect. So I don't know if you use uh, film in your teaching, but I've been using films for years, but lots of the global health films tend to be, particularly around AIDS, very much kind of like social histories of AIDS in North America and Europe. Uh, and that's great, but it doesn't tell you what's happening with the contemporary AIDS response, which is a very different picture. And so that these films didn't really exist. You saw them in small pockets, but not as a kind of feature film. So I thought, well, let's go off and make that. And then we were going to do it connecting to the institutions. And then that would have been clumsy. It would only work as a documentary. So, you know, you have little kind of like snippets here and there. If you're a keen governance observer, you might pick up on. But yeah, so it was audience. It was affect, but it was also about representation. So instead of me going around and saying, oh, yeah, but if you're a woman, you have to go to these three clinics to get your AIDS drugs or if this is happening. It was to allow those women to actually express themselves and tell the story themselves in their own language, with their own clothes and their own communities. Um, and you can say something like, you know, a woman has to go to three different clinics to get her antiretroviral treatment but if you actually see it happening it's something else because it has that build up of tension but also just that frustration it's just like oh for god's sake like just come on <laughs> you know and so these are some of the ways it's sort of show don't tell really that's what it came down to yes i think that effect came across really really well in the film and um i personally i thought it was i thought it was just incredible and a privilege to watch um I come from a theater background myself, and I noted that um, you used a combination of scripted dialogue and improvisation. So um, in relation to the power dynamics that you spoke of earlier, how did this approach sort of balance that? And uh, what did it give to the community in terms of telling the story in their own words? Oh, yeah, I mean, it's a really tricky one because we obviously scripted the whole film and that script was based on stories of just over 80 women that we sort of spoke to in the process of making the film. Um, and then we had to have the script to then organise how you're going to shoot it. So we weren't going to, you know, we had a very tight schedule. I mean, I've never written a film schedule before and I have and I'm now I've done it. I'm like, oh, this is actually quite cool. That, that was a fun bit, actually. Yeah, a bit of organisation. Um, but yes, yeah, so we had the script. But then when we went into the community, we said, like, we've got the script. We've translated it into Swahili because it was written in English. 
Um, everyone wanted a script, but lots of people didn't actually weren't actually able to read it. So there was a lot of working with interpreters to sort of say, this is what we want you to say at this bit. But obviously you just, you know, direct to Leanne Wellen would be able to say more about this. And, you know, you just actually say what you would say if you were trying to negotiate to get some black market antiretrovirals. Let's just play this out. Um, so it was also just to work with the women where they were at. Um, so we wanted to give them the script because they said they wanted it, but it was quite clear that not all of them could use it. So it was a bit of both. What was interesting in the community was some of the cast were very much like, oh, for God's sake, just this is your line, say the line correctly or sit, get to your mark or would be frustrated when other cast members wouldn't get it. So we were all sort of like, you know, me and Leanne were like, let's just be friendly, nice, conducive, get the best out of the actors, where some of the actors were like, if you mess up this line again, while I'm stood here in the sun, this is not cool. Um, so I don't know if we gave the community power. I think it's, I mean, Swahili isn't a language that's spoken super widely around the world, but it was really important that it was in Swahili, I think. Um, it also gives power to them because they could be in cahoots with some of the translators saying, you know, this Mzungu, this white woman is exploiting me, send help. And I would never know because my Swahili is very basic. I mean, I think I would probably get that. But um, so, yeah, it was important that it wasn't Swahili. And also it would have been impossible because they don't speak English. So it would have been... Yeah, it would be rubbish. I have a quick follow-up question about the film. Um, so there's one scene that really stood out to me was when she's going to, Pili's going to one of, I think it's like the third clinic of the day and she walks past this couple of, of white tourists shopping. And I guess just for me personally, I want to know, was that improvised or did you put that in? Because either way, I thought that was so powerful because you just look at them and you're like, you just know that they have all the privilege in the world and that they could probably afford to give her the deposit and you're like, oh, what? I don't know. I just thought it was a very, very powerful moment and it really like stuck out. Yeah, that was the, it's the only time you see anyone white in the film is that like flashing moment. And yeah, it was very deliberate. And it was deliberate on a couple of reasons because she's gone to Bagamoyo, which is a bigger town. It's a richer town. It's also where tourists sometimes come through as well. So you have, you know, backpacking hostels and things like that. And again, yeah, because they're looking at these goods and one of those goods could just be the amount of money that she needs for her deposit. And it's just a completely different world. So she's kind of like looking at them and then just kind of pays them no mind. But yeah, all these kind of little subtle things are all deliberate. I really loved it. I thought it was such a good touch. I was like, thank oh, you. Damn, so at good. one point, Leanne, the director was like, you need to do it because we can't find any uh, extras. And I was like, I am not being in the film. I have no interest in being in the film. So we just went to the backpacks and I think that cost me two margaritas each for them to be in the film. Yeah. That all went on my receipts and my expenses for the research. And I'll tell you that as well. Accounted Glad to hear it. Yeah, there's an, there's an audit trail. Yeah, very good. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> so you, did, you didn't make a cameo then, Sophie? No. Oh, I do actually. I think my voice is on one of the radios, sort of like the BBC World Service on her radio. That's the only cameo. I, I think I'm talking about Ebola. That's mm. it. But no. Um, so I suppose it, I, I'm curious to ask in the process of making the film, and engaging with with these people at that at the community level, gem, there's a general perception that the international organisations, the World Health Organisation, UNAIDS, and so on. Although UNAIDS has often has a rather perhaps more positive scorecard, but these organisations are kind of very distant, remote from the realities or that are actually happening out there uh, in these kinds of spaces. Um, uh, and often the WHO is kind of particularly sort of singled out as, as perhaps a more dysfunctional international organization, shall we say, uh, compared to others, whether that's fair or not, I'm not sure. Um, but I was curious to ask, I mean, you know, is your sense that these organizations are past their sell-by date, that, um, that they are no longer fit for purpose? And perhaps more concretely in light of this research and, and this experiential research, what is the, the role of, these in, of the international apparatus within these local contexts? What, mm. what should it be? So there's a couple of uh, points so I think I'm packed with that. And that's the first, the relevance of uh, global health institutions. And I think it's been a tricky year for that um, because obviously lots of people like me have come out and defended the WHO when it looked like the US was going to withdraw funding from it. 
But at the same time, the WHO is not without fault. Um, and it's been problematic for years and undergoing these processes of reform for years. And the one thing I'd say about global health is different to other forms of global governance, they always create new institutions and new treaties, and they always like doing new stuff. So it's quite an innovative space of governance to try and respond to the times. But the problem is the kind of stuff that they're doing is just rehashing the old problems of global health. And they, they just park it into a new institution and think, oh, well, we've separated out the problems. So you saw that when the WHO wasn't seen to be active enough on AIDS or involving civil society, they created UN AIDS. When after Ebola, they thought that not enough money was getting to countries, they set up the pandemic financing facility, but put it in the World Bank. Now you see COVAX that's now with the Gavi Alliance. So you have this separation out of the WHO, of all these global health initiatives. So does that mean the WHO is fit for purpose? Some people say you get what you pay for, but I think the WHO is not politically savvy. It has an arrogance to it that they're like, well, here is the guidance. This is what you should do. Um, and anyone in international relations knows, well, that's not enough. Um, and I think in this pandemic, it actually does have to have a real look at what how it balanced the investigation into the outbreak in Wuhan, how it worked with China, and then how it worked with other states as it progressed. And I think the after the investigation into what happened in Wuhan started to come out, you know, the WHO really changed its rhetoric. So Tedros, the director general, previously he'd been very, you know, we're collaborating with China, China is very open, Ch you know, don't blame China, this could happen anywhere. And then as soon as the investigation happened, the week before there was a switch and saying, actually China could have played ball a little bit better. And, you know, he's not fooling anyone and that doesn't do the WHO any favours. I'm not saying Donald Trump was right, but you can see how WHO walked into that trap very much. So both set by China and the US, how it walked into that proxy war. In terms of WHO's relevance on the ground in countries, I mean, again, WHO is one of those institutions you actually don't see its footprint. And it's really interesting to me. If you go into a country like Sierra Leone, for example, you see UNFPA, you see UNICEF, the footprint there, all the bilaterals is very evident, whereas the WHO, its footprint is, is lacking. And that was both during, I think, the Ebola response. And even when I was there in 2020, it's sort of like, what, what's it actually doing? Now, WHO might say, well, that's part of our intent because we work with governments government say what we do so we shouldn't be you know you shouldn't be able to see what we do but then I think that's a bit of a cop out I'm I'm never really convinced what technical support what you know what does WHO do it justifies itself a lot I think by saying we provide the good of global health security but people have got to get behind it I think and I think yeah I'm sort of going in a circular motion here because it's the tricky one because Everything that people suggest at the moment during COVID-19 of what we need in pandemic preparedness and response exists and it exists within the WHO. So either get behind that or don't. But this whole, you know, new pandemic treaty, it does exactly what the international health regulations do. Setting up a new institution for pandemics, it does exactly what the global health security section of the WHO does. So, you know, the risk is that's what the WHO becomes. And I think if that's going to be a problem because people working within the WHO really resent this kind of global health security, big pandemic kind of outbreak focus because they want to do health system strengthening, universal health coverage, nutrition, water sanitation. That's what they're sort of like seeing public health, basically. And so you see this real tension happening. And I think that's what's going to happen in the last year. What, oh, sorry, in the next years to come post pandemic. That's really interesting. Uh, just perhaps a, a question on something I teach on. I mean, when you're thinking about sort of prototyping good global governance, one thing about the WHO that really stands out is that they have a legislative assembly. They have the World Health Authority assembly, sorry, um, which is quite unusual within the IO landscape in that it's a sort of a, it's similar to the General Assembly. It's kind of a you know, there's a there's a sort of democratic ethos, at least formally speaking. Mm -hmm. And I was just wondering. Um, you know, what's your take on the World Health Assembly? And to what extent does that actually fulfill a democratic function in the global health space? 
Yeah, it's really interesting because global governance people love the World Health Organization. Tom Weiss, he's always like, the World Health Organization always scores very highly on whatever indicator on global governance. Because, yeah, because of the World Health Assembly and this idea that sovereign states are kind of equal within the World Health Assembly. I mean, and also the regional, I think the bigger thing is the WHO is made up of regional bodies. And so its HQ is sort of subservient to those regional bodies. Um, which you would say is actually quite a good thing in the world because you're dispersing power. But in a way, it's a bit of a chimera because it's those states that fund the WHO. It's the funding of the WHO that's the real issue. So even though you've got kind of the states within the World Health Assembly who have this kind of equal democratic presence, your problem is, is the WHO is funded by this combination of assessed and voluntary contributions, which we see in other uh, UN organisations like UNHCR, I think, is, has had similar issues with that, where states allocate funding to its WHO's general budget and then basically to very specific health issues. And so the funding is like now split 80 percent towards states earmarking what they want and then 20 percent to the general budget, which hamstrings the institution, because how are you ever going to plan? And states are always going to invest in things that they want to. So more money is therefore going to go to polio, uh, emergency outbreaks, things like that. Whereas something as basic as health systems just never gets the money or water never gets any money. So I think it's less, you know, it's great that we have these uh, systems in place, but unless you sort out the financing, it, yeah, you can vote whatever you want in the World Health Assembly. Everyone can commit to universal health coverage, but no one's going to pay for it. Yes, going back to the funding, I, I had a question about um, this kind of codependent relationship that the world now has to these global institutions. And as you were saying before, you know, there are um, regulations in place that address a lot of the challenges uh, that the world is facing and, and then that that's within the WHO. But again, we have this kind of stagnant, um, you know, circular uh, problem when it comes to addressing initiatives and actually getting things going that um, maybe people on the ground would actually experience. So is funding responsible for this kind of uh, tension of between what we need and you know what's actually going on? Is that what needs to change in order to kind of break the codependent relationship that the world has with global institutions like the WHO? Oh, yeah, I think, yeah, <laughs> effectively. I mean, it's sort of, what's weird in global health is, you know, the needs of people around the world does not define what gets funded the interests of those states that give the aid is what defines what gets funded so of course while you're always going to have that disconnect that's always going to be a problem I think what's interesting and this is why it's important to do research in those aid recipient countries or those countries that really rely on kind of money is how those countries use certain budget allocations to fund other things. So if you know you've got a chunk of money coming to HIV and AIDS, which was really big in the early 2000s, how you can creatively use that for say maternal mortality within your budget lines. So if you're setting up a big AIDS clinic, why not just put another room next to it that's for you know, maternal health? So there is some creative ways in which states then use that cash to fund other things or fund health systems, basically. Um, but yeah, of course, if you don't kind of level out these kind of um, questions around what states want to fund, but then what other states need, then global health is never going to advance. Particularly because of this kind of what we call in global health vertical funding, so funding specific issues. It's really easy. If you want health to be better in the world, fund health systems. I mean, imagine being in Canada or the UK and someone saying, well, 70% of the UK's budget is going to go to breast cancer because we really care about breast cancer. And then we'll have a bit more to pandemic preparedness and then everything else, GP surgeries, that's going to be like 20% of your budget, right? That's just going to collapse. And yet we persevere with this model of financing in global health. Now, the answer to that is institutions would say, well, that's not really a good comparison because states should be able to then fund these health systems. But those aid recipient states that should should be funding these health systems are also too busy servicing the international projects around these big flagship issues. So even if they had the money or they wanted to, when would they ever have the time to do it as well? So it's money and time. Um, moving from 
states to private corporations. I was wondering uh, your opinion on whether um, a stable universal healthcare system can coexist when companies continue to make money, more money off of sick people than of healthy people. Oh, yeah. I mean, that's the, the, the big North American question as well. And it's engrossing a question in the UK. Um, it's, it's the Gramscian in me, right? So like, you know, optimism of the will, pessimism of the intellect, like I would hope so. And that I think you can still have this push for universal health coverage that is free at the point of access, that isn't a but for profit. However, I think increasingly when we see increased privatization of healthcare, that is gonna become a problem. And people keep asking me whether I think COVID-19 will change that, that, you know, people will start to recognize the value of public health. But also COVID-19 is going to come with a huge paycheck to the taxpayer. So I think we're going to see more private actors and that cycle is actually going to get worse. But I would love to be wrong on that. So I had a bit of a question. Um, I read a paper you put out recently about gender and global health. Um, the one about where global uh, gender is a threat to global health. And I thought it was quite interesting in terms of what you were saying about the creative accounting for like the maternal... Um, healthcare, but then also the fact of COVID-19 drawing attention to things, because in your paper you noted that COVID-19, everyone's like talking about gender, but not tangibly changing anything about gender. And I thought that that phrase, you know, gender equality is incompatible with global health security because it's a threat. I'd love to kind of pick your brain a bit more about that and, you know, if you could expand on that a bit more and and what what systems, how would you redesign, I guess, for gender to no longer be a threat to health? To global health and how would that how would they coexist and maybe how could we break out of reifying gender stereotypes instead of just using them in a damaging way okay no problem I've got all the answers no so I mean last year was weird for everyone but I think it was really weird for me because at the start of the year I was in Sierra Leone looking at the gendered impact of pan, um, health emergencies in this case Ebola and then of course this was all you know erupting in the UK and so I was like, oh, everyone's interested in my research. This is weird. <laughs> yeah. And suddenly people were talking about gender and people were really interested in this. And everyone's like, what we need is we need more evidence, you know, in global governance. Everyone's like, more evidence, more data, and then we'll act on it. And I was like, right, yeah. And then I was like, do you know what? I'm calling bullshit on this because you have all the evidence. We've been seeing this from AIDS. We've seen this from Ebola. We've seen this from Zika. We know what the gendered impact of health emergencies and pandemics are. Yes, this is, so in the UK, this is the UK, it's not Tanzania, it's not Sierra Leone. However, there are going to be trends that are going to be similar. Violence against women in lockdown, that should just be obvious. And so it wasn't that there wasn't any data, it was that people suddenly actually just didn't care. And I was like, no, is it not that they don't care what's going on? And that's when it sort of clicked for me is that gender and gender norms are seen as solutions to health crises, that women will just absorb this, right? And that it will be expected that when you close the schools, that's fine because somebody's gonna look after the children. Now, we know that men upped their work in the home during the pandemic, but not to the same extent as women. So there was just this expectation that people would be like, okay, yeah, I'm just not gonna do my work, I'm gonna look after my kids. And so it was there for the solution. So this is like, oh, this is it. They do understand gender. They just see it as the solution to these issues. Whereas what they need to do is see it as a threat because gender norms shape behavior. So how you access healthcare while you might be susceptible to infection for the types of jobs you do or how you understand behavior change communication it also makes you incredibly vulnerable to violence to your mental health and well-being, yet there's just this, yeah, but it's always secondary to the main thing. So if you ever talk to anyone in global health who's working in pandemic response, they'll use this kind of emergency imperative idea of like, that's just secondary. You know, we just got to get contact tracing done. That's the main thing. They said that with Ebola. They said that with COVID-19 with no recognition for who are, is doing the work, right? And then fundamentally, you know, it's the solution because all most not all, <laughs> most healthcare workers in the world are women. So they're on the front lines, even though I hate that term. So global health security just depends on women being the solution to the problem. 
And they're never going to see it as a threat because then you're going to actually have to start paying women more, giving infrastructure around that. And there's just no interest or someone like the WHO would be like, well, we don't do that. We just do the health stuff. Same in the domestic health systems. You know, a Ministry of Health would say, well, we don't do that. That should be social security. And I think part of the solution to that then is actually first getting some feminists who understand gender in global health institutions. It's quite a big one. Secondly, marrying health and care seeing that labour as care and reframing this idea of saying, actually, these are threats to women. Women are not the solutions. And reproducing these gender narratives is really problematic. And that also has to happen with those women who are concerned about these issues. One thing that I was really uncomfortable with was when everyone said, oh, women leaders are better at responding to pandemics because they're caring, because they listen, they're consensual. And I was just, again, like, calling bullshit on this, this is yet another gender stereotype that reproduces these norms that this is how women act and that women are expected to mop up all these problems. That's not the case. Also, don't ever call out who's doing well and who's not doing well in a pandemic because look at Angela Merkel. Everyone's like, she's great. She's doing really, really well. Look at Angela Merkel now. Lots of criticism around the response in Germany. So really, yeah, I'm just my sort of issue with that is it's really important that there's so much recognition and awareness now of gender and pandemics i think that's fantastic all the research is brilliant but ultimately these institutions know it they are deliberately ignoring it and that is what we need to draw our attention to we have a colleague at ucl who i'm sure you know professor sarah hawks who's doing really pioneering work on the way gender norms inform global health and sort of really upending a lot of these implicit assumptions that are very pervasive it seems in 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 sort of the mainstream policy discourse and it seems like this is maybe an opportunity to break the frame to really think hard about how we're actually understanding these problems and i think that speaks to the bigger debate about well how do we how do we fix global governance if that's even the right way of thinking about it um a lot of these problems are very long standing. You know, a lot of the problems which these organizations have been uh, supposedly created to, to fix, to solve, have not been solved. And we're sort of, we're now 50, 60, 70 years after their establishment. So it seems as if on some level we need to delve to a, to a deeper level of understanding well, what is the problem? You know, how do we constitute the goal? Who, whose voice is heard when we constitute that goal. Mm. And I mean, I, we've been doing a lot of work here on the podcast around complexity thinking uh, in the context of climate change, which reflects a bit on my own research at the moment. And when we think about global health, you know, clearly there's a lot of intersection here with other domains. I mean, you've done work at the interface with trade. We had Susan Kaysell on the podcast uh, a few months ago, um, but also, of course, climate change as well and the toxification of our, our environment. Um, so it seems like we are dealing with hard problems. Some people call those sort of wicked problems. Um, how, how do you think we can make progress in terms of actually you know, what, what is the first step to framing a problem, you know, in, in a way which actually is going to open up new vistas for thinking about what well, actually it's more complex than that? <laughs> you just love a bit of complexity, don't you, Tom? Um, <laughs> can't help yourself. Um, yeah, I think it's really interesting because this last year I've done more kind of policy facing work and you end up sounding like a realist all the time. Well, you talk about like, you know, IR 101 and interests and values and all this kind of stuff. And yeah, how do you just go, oh, well, it's a little bit more complex and, you know, it's how do you sort of reorient towards solutions? And I suppose it is actually a bit more simple because the same mistakes keep happening. You know, the same mistakes of just not going and asking a country what their health system needs is is just happens. Why do they why do institutions not do that anymore? And I think actually this is why international relations and global governance is so important, because most people who work in these kind of institutions tend to be economists or policy people or very specialized in certain sectors, particularly in global health, they tend to have come from clinical or public health backgrounds, but not necessarily a kind of governance or politics background. There's an assumption that that's just easy. Like if you just read the paper, 
or you eat some Chomsky, you're fine. And I think we need to actually leverage some of our ability to sort of say, well, here's some of the issues you've got. You've got all these competing actors and interests, whether it's private, public, um, different state interests. Yes, this is all coming together, but there are ways in which you can manage that, but you have to get the fundamentals right. And I think that is always kind of missing within these institutions. Um, and it's to do it in a way that you don't say, well, it's a little bit complex and you know everyone's got their economic interests and things like that. But also, do you know what? Just being accountable and transparent is huge. I mean, look at what's happening now with COVID-19 and the vaccines. No one's publishing the contracts that you know these institutions are having with pharmaceutical companies. No one's knowing what's going on behind closed doors. And that's just bad governance practice because raises questions it feeds conspiracy theories it makes people think that something's happening that's untoward or unequal and so actually i would say the solution to the complexity question is getting the basics right which institutions fail to do time and time again yeah i like that a lot uh and i know sort of nora bateson who's a sort of major major figure in complexity thinking she often says that the the sort of antithesis to complexity isn't simplicity it's a reductionism I think that's quite interesting to yeah. to ponder, as you say, get the basics right. Uh, and yeah, I, I, and I think so. For example, I mean, you also mentioned. I mean, Sarah Hawkes is fantastic work with Global Health Fifty Fifty. You know, she has done something which is huge, but it's basic, and I mean that in the base in the best possible way. I'm not criticizing the work for being basic in that kind of insulting sense, but genuinely, she's just said like, okay. So let's look at these institutions, their representation, their strategies, their policies. Let's just look at it all and let's break it down and show you what the problem is. And then you just can't deny that there's a problem because it's there. And she does it in such an effective way. So it's making something complex like gender norms, these kind of things that people can't necessarily grapple with and saying, well, here it is. And I think we need more of that. Yeah, and I've done a bit of work with Sarah and also with um, Kent Buse on profit-driven disease, non-communicable diseases. And it seems as if the the orthodox solutions to global health problems don't seem to have much traction when we move into that domain. So it may be that we need to start from understanding the the problem first, as opposed to working forward from the from the assumed uh, solution which again is something which is actually, it, it takes a bit of work to disentangle that and to ensure that everyone's sort of on the same page, shall we say, in terms of points of departure. Yeah, absolutely. I think that's a really interesting insight that they start with the solution rather than working out what the problem is. Or there's a sort of defensiveness sometimes in global health where they're like, well, we can't do this because otherwise this person's going to be annoyed and we can't do this, otherwise this institution is going to be annoyed rather than saying, what's the problem? And then what is the appropriate solution? But also sometimes the what's the problem question can be an excuse to do nothing because then it takes you back to the, we don't have any data, we don't have any evidence, which is always the way in which there's an excuse not to do anything. So yeah, I think more, instead of starting with the solution, think about what the problem is. And importantly, if you don't know, it's okay. I think there's a lot of kind of egos involved, people wanting, you know, understandably progression in their own careers where they're appointed to a role and they think they should know stuff and they don't. And instead of slowing down and actually engaging with that, they don't. And so they're, they're appointed to come with solutions rather than being appointed to try and diagnose what the problem is. And I think that's also got something to do with the temporality of policy and governance as well. It's always got to be quick. It's like, what's the goals? How do we do it? How do we have action? How do we show results? How do we show performance? And that is just not helping either. Yeah. And it seems sometimes as if we're almost drowning in data (laughs) and it's getting more challenging to make sense of the data. And there seems to be this idea that eventually alpha go or alpha zero is going to step in and just, it it will fix global health. You know, we can remove the human uh, component, the the, the flawed human (laughs) elements, Uh, but I'm not sure about that. No, you should read. There's a great book that came out last year, but got lost because of the pandemic by Sarah Davis, Sarah Meg Davis. There are two Sarah Davis in uh, global health, which is quite confusing. So Sarah L. M. Davis on, uh, I think it's the the uncounted. Yeah, the uncounted. uh, It's the politics of data. And it's brilliant. It's really, really good. Um, So if you're interested in data and yeah, 
don't leave it to the algorithm. You should definitely read Sarah's book. And she's great because she kind of breaks down how these systems work. And it's just, yeah, mind boggling to me. Mm, sounds fantastic. Well, we should get her on the podcast. Yeah. Yeah, you um, should. Definitely. So I do want to just pick up on the issue of private power within the COVID-19 context. You, you recently weighed in on the question of vaccine equity in a piece in the conversation with, with, uh, with some other colleagues. And it was, it was a really interesting read. I mean, you're basically reflecting on these issues of hierarchy, of unequal power and global health structures, uh, the prospects of these multilateral solutions like the COVAX scheme um, possibly falling short. But I was really struck by some of the very concrete suggestions that you close out the piece with, uh, in, including states being prepared to disrupt power relations within supply chains by breaking contracts with the big pharma companies. Mm -hmm. And this, to my ears, almost sounded like a, 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 a call for states to engage in civil disobedience. So, yeah. I mean, to what extent do powerful, wealthy, private entities now call the shots in global health governance? Oh, well, they've always called the shots and they still do. I mean, look at look at it. I mean, look at how our access to vaccines is happening. It's all being defined by pharmaceutical companies and brokers who are brokering those relationships between states to invest and institutions to invest in the development of these vaccines and then what they're going to pay for them. But ultimately, it's the pharmaceutical companies that have states over a barrel because we really need the vaccines to get out of this. And the negotiating position of states, I mean, you can see the desperation. So it's a really bad negotiating position to be in. Um, and I think what's really interesting to me is, I mean, I was just not looking at COVAX. I was like, yeah, COVAX, blah, blah, blah. So COVAX is funding facility to ensure that every country in the world has enough doses for 20% of their population. And people would ask me, and I wouldn't think about it, until my friend, uh, Roisin Reed, who also does lots of work on humanitarian governance at the University of Manchester, she just messaged me one day and just went, what's up with this? Like, why are states doing this? Why are they just not like not obeying by the rules? And it was just like a light bulb moment. I just thought, oh my gosh, she's so right. Um, so I can't really claim this idea, it's Roisin's, but you know, COVAX is just charity. It's a front really for maintaining these unequal systems of intellectual property. And it's saying to other countries that can't afford to do these bilateral deals, don't worry, we're just going to ensure, you know, these doses for 20% of your population, which is not nearly enough to deal with the problem. Whilst also kind of like, it's a kind of way in which you then stop states pushing these wider questions. And what's really interesting to me, and I would love to find out, is whether when everything kicked off with COVID-19 and the extent to which it did early last year, and people were developing the idea for COVAX kind of before that, but really hit, hits up now, were they thinking about what happened with the TRIPS, the Trade Related Intellectual Property Amendment around antiretrovirals and HIV back in the early 2000s or 1999, I can't remember the exact date, when the South African, South African government forced the issue and said, this is grossly unfair. We have a major epidemic of AIDS. We're paying more than people in Europe are and North America for AIDS drugs. This is grossly unfair. We're just going to issue compulsory licenses and buy drugs from India. Go, yeah, go sue us effectively. Tried to sue them. Didn't work. And then you had this TRIPS amendment. So I'm thinking, was there a conversation where everyone said this could happen again? We need to step in institutions to stop this from happening. And that's not a conspiracy theory. That's a genuine is we need to have an equitable institution and COVAX was the result. But then that wise kind of raises the question of why are states not issuing compulsory licenses for COVID vaccines? That's in the rules. So the World Trade Organization technically says you can do that in the state of a health emergency states can issue compulsory licenses. Obviously they have to have manufacturing capacity or be friendly with states that do. But then also this point that you said about basically, yeah, a bit of civil disobedience and publishing, breaking contract with pharmaceutical companies and publishing what you pay. I think that's one of those questions of social justice. It's an ends justifies the means kind of idea that really this is a state of emergency. So if you're not gonna do it, when, when are you gonna do it? And I don't think the world is going to come down on you. And that's, I mean, it's a risk, isn't it? It's a huge risk. It's who's going to blink and do this. And I think that's a really interesting one to watch because you can see some states 
kind of playing both sides that India, obviously, because it's manufacturing so many vaccines, want to keep in with the kind of global north argument, but then he's very much currying favour with this global south equity, you know, what we're going to do, we need to push this reform. South Africa, because the internal politics of South Africa, I don't know if they would do it. It's it's a real risk, but it would be interesting to see. Yeah, and I was just like, you know what, if not now, when? And if you're not going to make a bold suggestion now, when are you going to do it? So, yeah, that's why we said it. Yeah, we're waiting for one of those states to break ranks. Yeah, but which one do you think will do it first? Shall we, shall we shall, we'll lay out some odds? Yeah, <laughs> that would be so grim. <laughs> yeah, let's not do that. I think there's also some really great student research projects there in the last five minutes. <laughs> some fascinating <laughs> strands to pick up on. So we're we're coming up to close to the hour. Time flies when you're having fun. Um, I want to give the last question to to Zoe, please, Zoe. So my question was sort of bringing it back a bit more full full circle to what we started with would be, what advice would you have for students of global politics? who are inspired to transgress disciplinary boundaries and explore visual methods and maybe more alternative methods of storytelling and of engaging with their research in service to an academic career? I think first, all students of global politics have value and recognizing the value of the expertise that you have. Um, I know lots of students I teach come into looking at global politics at the end go there's more problems there's more complexity <laughs> I wanted a solution so you might not have the solution to world peace but that's okay you still have value and you can still really help and I think that's really come to the fore with COVID-19 you know this isn't a health crisis it's a political crisis that is a cliche but the type of knowledge I think that international relations global politics students have is really really important um, if that's because you know you understand the neo-realism neo-liberal debate you might think that's so abstract but states actually use some of these terms to really present themselves in the world or they talk about norms these aren't just things that we talk about in the classroom and deconstructing how and when states use that is very interesting to see how they position themselves within institutions and how institutions actually respond to state behavior as well. So I think, you know, the fundamental thing is your work has real value and you really should recognize that. And sometimes you can feel a bit crowded out by the economists or the epidemiologists or whatever, just, you know, just ignore them. Your work has value and it's really important. And the other thing is, is just to keep going. So sometimes it can drag you down. And sometimes when things you think, you know, so I've seen HIV and gender, I've seen Ebola and Zika and gender, and now we have COVID-19. You just think, why do these things keep happening? But you have to take the small wins as much as you can. And then, yeah, enjoy what you do and be judicious in your use of social media. I mean, I think everyone knows that, but debates on social media can suck you in. It's great for learning about new research. It's great for solidarity, but there's also a lot of nonsense as well that you just don't want to get involved in. And then just be a good person. <laughs> I know that sounds really basic, but there's a lot of people in academia that uh, are fantastic, kind and supportive and great colleagues. And you want to be that type of person. You don't want to be the person that everyone bitches about in the conference because we all know who you are. Sounds like that's great advice. Thank you, Sophie. I'm, I'm going to use that in when I do my introduction talk with my students next, <laughs> <laughs> next year. That's great. Thank you so much for your time. We've really enjoyed it. My goodness, we've covered such sort of rich territory, loads of detail, loads of provo provocations. I mean, it's just fascinating. And I really encourage everyone listening to this to check out the doc the, the, the feature film, Peely, uh, which is a which is really a, 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 a fantastic piece of work. And I don't know, Sophie, would you would you make another film? <laughs> <laughs> no never no. again okay. I mean no I mean you never say never but you know in a kind of football analogy played one 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 I would say so what I'm quite enjoying now is kind of supporting other people who want to make films so I think it's really noticeable that um my film was funded by AXA Insurance. I tried to get funding for film from all the kind of research councils and it was always seen as like yeah nice idea can't pull it off Again, look at me now. Um, but if having my name as an advisor on a funding application ha 
that helps someone else get funding to make a film and they just have someone that can be a bit more handholding, then that's what I want to do. Um, so, you know, send me your applications. No, please don't. I'm really busy. But yeah, as much as I can, that's what I want to do. Support people as much as I can that, that way. Fantastic. Well, you heard it here. So yeah, thank you, Sophie. Thank you for your time. And, um, you know, we'll be, we'll be following what you do next after global health. It's going to be exciting. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> Thanks, Tom. Thanks, Jess. Thanks, Zoe. It's been fun. Thanks. Take care. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thanks for tuning in to Imperfect Utopias. To get access to all of our content and to stay up to date with future Zoom calls, workshops, and events and more, check us out at ucl.ac.uk forward slash global dash governance. If you like this content, please do leave us a comment and subscribe. Till next time.